Let us remain standing just for a moment while we read the word of the Lord. You who would like to turn to the scripture reading tonight, turn to Matthew 12, beginning with the 38th verse. And there, then certain of the scribes and all the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would seek a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall be no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The man of Nineveh shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Let us bow our heads. With our heads and hearts bowed in his presence, is there a request in here tonight that you'd like to be remembered in prayer? If so, just raise your hands and signify by that, God, hear my request. I pray silently while we go to prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are deeming this one of the most grandest privileges that we have this side of glory is to meet in the congregation of the people who believe in you. That where we can expect your presence, because it's according to your promise. You said where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. And if they can agree upon any certain thing and ask, they shall receive it. Lord, the greatest thing that we could agree upon tonight, that you would just meet with us that we might behold your presence, sense it in our spirits, and know that you're here. And in your presence, we feel that we can pour out our hearts in supplication. And as we meditate upon thee, may we feel this great sense of the answer of our prayers. As we're asking now, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. I want to take the subject of Lord willing with some scriptures I have written out here for just a few moments before we go to prayer for the sick. Upon the subject of a greater than Solomon is here now. We find in our beginning of the scripture tonight where our text is found that Jesus was disputing with the Pharisees. He was rebuking them because that they had not understood him. A man that the theologians that had been trained looking forward for the time of his appearing, and then when he arrived, they misunderstood him and had called him a devil. They said that the ministry he had was of the devil because he could discern the thoughts that were in their hearts. And by this, they thought him to be some kind of a, of a witch doctor or some, uh, like a fortune teller. And anyone knows that's evil spirits. And then to call the work of God an evil spirit was blaspheming. And he had told them he would forgive them for it because the Holy Spirit had not come as yet to tender up their hearts and to... to make them in condition so that they would understand God. Their hearts was far away from God, and all they know was cold theology of the law, and they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. But he said, when the Holy Spirit has come and does the same thing, to speak against that, it's never forgiven in this world nor the world to come. Now, I was thinking as I was reading this this afternoon and meditating upon it, of how that if they, one of them here come to him in a roundabout way and asked him, said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. In other words, the Jews were always to talk, to believe signs. The Jews seek signs always. And 
the Greeks' wisdom. We find that these Jews was relying upon a sign. Now, what a, a very uh, witness against this Pharisee that him supposedly knowing the Scriptures that the sign of the Messiah, Jesus had already performed it, and his eyes were so darkened that he didn't recognize it. Jesus had, Jesus had given him the true scriptural Messiah sign that was promised in the scripture. But he was looking for some other kind of a sign. And how true that stands with teachers of today and people of today. They can see something that's solid and in the scripture promised by God for the day. And then they can see that, but yet they are looking forward to something. They want to see something else. And not taking the sign of the time. He told them once, said, you can discern the skies when it's lower and red. You'll say when it's lowering and red, tomorrow will be foul weather and so forth. But said, you can discern the, the signs in the skies, but the signs of the time you don't understand. For truly the scripture had said that this Messiah would be a prophet. We know that God's way of doing things was always sending a prophet to vindicate his message. Never has failed. Never will fail. God cannot change his way. What his first decision is, it must ever remain that way. What he says is true. God never did deal in great groups. He always deals with an individual. That's how he's taken a people out of the Gentiles for his name. Just an individual, one here and there for his name. He deals with an individual, not by groups. And we find that it, the reason they believe this, that a prophet must be a identified witness of God. Or when he said anything and it come to pass and he said again and it come to pass and whatever he said... God vindicated to be true. Then he said, hear him, for I am with him. Now we find that Moses, who they claimed to believe in, had told them that the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet likened unto me. To him the people must hear. And all that didn't believe this prophet would be cut off from the people. We find that to be true. He came to his own. His own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave him the power. Gave them the power to become sons of God. How we find these Pharisees looking right and Sadducees upon exactly what the promise of God said that he would do, and there they was still seeking a sign, not knowing that that was the true Messiah sign that uh, he was to give. Philip understood it when he told him where he was the day before. He understood that was the Messiah, said, Thou art the Christ, and you're the King of Israel. And so he, he recognized that because he was given to that. He was, Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all the Father has given me will come to me. No matter how much we try to get any other way, it's got to be God. It's not him that willeth or him that runneth, it's God that showeth mercy. God is the one that does the choosing. You haven't chose me, said Jesus, I've chose you. And now we find that the Antichrist in the last day will deceive all that dwells upon the earth whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. Your name was put in God's book before the Lamb was slain, when his program was laid out, the whole thing. You were recognized in that program because you got eternal life the word eternal never did begin and neither can it end. And you are an attribute of God's thinking before the world was ever created. That's the only way you have eternal life. And that life that he was thinking of you is in you now. There's no way to separate it. It's in there to stay. Notice now, these Pharisees, yet being religious teachers, great scholars of theology, studied the book day and night, failed to see that Messiah sign and was here trying to ask him for a sign. That I might further the thing to let you know that God always gives signs because he's supernatural. He always deals with people through signs, scriptural signs. In the Old Testament, 
when they had a, a question, someone dreamed a dream and there was no, uh, no a prophet there. They took him down to the temple where they had what they called the Urim Thundum. You Bible teachers understand what I mean. It was uh, the breastplate that Aaron wore that had the twelve stones that represented the twelve tribes of Israel. They hung that up on a post. And then when this prophet or this dreamer or whatever it was told his vision or his dream, regardless of how real it seemed, if them supernatural lights didn't come up making the Urim Thundum, on that breastplate, it was rejected. God refused it. There must be a supernatural sign from God to vindicate, no matter how real, how deep it was in theology, how great it sounded, it's still, if God's supernatural sign didn't vindicate it, it wasn't so to the Jew. Now, the Old Testament, the Aaron's plate was done away with the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, God still remains with the Urim Thundum. That is, if a prophet, dreamer, theologian, or whatever it is, speaks something that's contrary to the Word and God don't echo it back to the Word, I'll let it alone. For it's God's Urim Thundum. And I believe it with all my heart that it's God's Word, and God is His own Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still... Uh, God don't need any interpreter. We interpret. We say this, that, this is that, and this is that, and so forth. God don't need an interpreter. He's his own interpreter. God don't need us to interpret his word. The Bible is written and it said it's of no private interpretation. God said in the beginning, let there be light. And there was light. That's the interpretation of it. God said, a virgin shall conceive, and she did. That's the interpretation of it. It doesn't need anybody to interpret. God said, in this day, these things would happen, and they are. You don't need any interpretation. It's God doing his own interpretation. It happens. No matter how much we try to twist it and say it, it don't mean this and don't mean that, it means just exactly, and God's his own interpreter. He vindicates his word, and that's his interpretation of it, because it's brought to pass. Now we find these fellows there in Matthew, the 12th chapter, 38th to 40th verse, and they were uh, asking him, Master, we would seek a sign from thee. And he was upbraiding them because they had not believed him. And it called the very spirit that was upon him an evil spirit in their unbelief because they couldn't identify him among their, their clergymen. They couldn't identify his, you know, where he come from. They didn't know what school he come from, whether he was a Pharisee or Sadducee, and was constantly trying to tear down their institutions of, of theology and call them a bunch of snakes and why well, they couldn't identify him anywhere. And so where'd this man come from? We know not whence he is. And they didn't realize the very sign that he was the Messiah was there. I like that little woman at the well we spoke of night before last. She recognized it. And it did something for her. And those who recognized it, it, they were the seed of God that was to be called in that day. God in always and all times as always gives spiritual gifts to his people. That's how he's identified and known by spiritual gifts. And when God sends a spiritual gift to his people and that spiritual gift is rejected, then that Play, that people goes into the darkness of a chaos. Every time through the ages when God sends something to the people, a gift, and they turn it down, that people is rejected by God because it's rejected God's mercy. Oh, what a safety it would be tonight. How much greater it would be than all the bomb shelters and, and all the places we could think of. If this nation, which is called a Christian nation, could accept the gift of God that's been given to it, the great Holy Spirit poured out in this last days, and how that if this nation would accept that, it would be more safety than anything they could get into. But they've turned it down, so there's nothing left but chaos and judgment. All ages he gave these great spiritual gifts. And notice, always the coming of a spiritual gift, a true gift. I want to speak one night on the voice of the gift, but if the Lord willing. But always these gifts are usually announced by prophets. And then 
when you see a prophet rise on the scene, that shows that judgment is at hand. Now, it's a sign. When you see a identified prophet of God rise on the scene in the days of Jeremiah, in the days of Daniel, in the days of of uh, John the Baptist in the days of the Lord Jesus and all down through when a prophet raises on the scene it's time that God's going to speak his word the nations reject it and then chaos sets in that's the way it was in the changing of the church ages each time when the message was rejected God giving these gifts and messages to the people and they turn them down then there's nothing left but judgment God's just He will not send judgment before he offers mercy. And mercy is foretold in how it will come. But the people usually so all mixed up and in their minds and so many different man-made schemes till they don't recognize it. And that's the way it always happens. Now we find that he told them that a, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after signs. How many times the unbeliever has taken advantage of this, about scriptural signs, and don't believe it? God always speaks with signs. He forever has. He forever will. As long as there's a world, he'll still speak by spiritual signs. He's foretold they would come. Now, many of the unbelievers take that when he said a wicked and a weak and adulterous generation seeks after signs. Watch. He was speaking in a compound prophecy here. He was also telling them that they were a weak and adulterous generation and also telling them that uh, any weak and adulterous generation and one that would come would receive a sign. Notice, he said, A weak and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and nights, So must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and nights. What was he saying here? He was saying that a wicked and adulterous generation would receive the sign of the resurrection. And what other age have we ever come to any more than it is right now to a Christ-rejecting, wicked, perverted, adulterous generation? And they will receive a sign, the sign of the resurrection that Jesus Christ is alive tonight just as much as he ever was. He is raised from the dead, making him the same yesterday, today, and forever. A weak and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and they'll get it. And the sign will be the sign of the resurrection. Now, of course, he was speaking to them that he would raise up from the dead. Many times, Scripture has its common or its compound a meaning. Like in Matthew 3 it said that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying out of Egypt I call my son. Now if you refer that back it's to Hosea and he prophesied that out of Egypt he called God's son which was Israel. Jacob was God's son and he called him out of Egypt. That's where the reference runs you to. But also Christ was his greater son and he called him out Israel being a type. And so that being a type of rejecting Christ in that generation, this is a greater type. For that generation that rejected the resurrection had pardon. But this generation who makes fun of the Holy Ghost is impardonable. Where greater is he that rejects the Holy Spirit than he that rejects Jesus Christ in the days of his flesh on the earth. Jesus said so. You speak against the Son of Man when they said he was a fortune teller or some evil spirit. Said, you speak against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven you. But whoever speaks a word against the Holy Ghost shall never be forgiven them in this world. That is called the working of the Holy Ghost, an evil, unclean thing. And you see the work of God being done. Yes, Jonah was a witness of the resurrection as he was in the belly of the whale for three days and nights. Many people try to condemn Jonah and say that all oh, he, everybody, he was a Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. He is walking exactly in the will of God. When he took that wrong ship and got out there, that had to be done. It must be that way to show forth the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He had to play that just the same as Hagar was put out, that the free woman would not be heir with the bondswoman. These things had to happen. They were shadows and types of the things to come. Now we find out he comes down then after speaking of Jonah 
and he comes to a Solomon's age. Now we all know that Solomon's age was the millennium almost of the Old Testament. It was the greatest time of all Israel ever had was under the reign of Solomon. No wars to speak of. And they had a great time. God gave Solomon, which was a son of David, gave him a gift of discernment. And now he could discern the thoughts in the people's heart. Now how that Hebrew standing there ought to have recognized that? Solomon had a, a gift of discernment. And he could discern the thoughts in their heart. And they all rallied around Solomon. And yet here stood a greater than Solomon. And Solomon was the son of David. But he was the lesser son of David by the flesh. And Jesus was the son of David by seed of the promise, the royal seed. And here was a greater than Solomon standing there doing the same thing that Solomon done, only being a greater than Solomon, and they called it Beelzebub. You see the interpretation of the Scripture? No wonder he said what he did, a wicked and adulterous generation will seek after a sign, and they'll get it. The sign of the resurrection. And in Solomon's age, there was a great revival on. I'll kind of give it an illustration so the young can understand it. There was a great revival that was going on in the days of Solomon. God gave a gift and the whole nation rallied around it. Everybody come to it. They believed in it wholeheartedly. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if it happened amongst the people tonight? If all America, all people that call themselves Christians would rally around God's gift in this last days, the pouring out of the Holy Ghost upon the people, that's God's gift in this last day, is the Holy Spirit. Christ in the form of Spirit. He's here with us now. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all the churches that profess to be Christians would rally around this great gift that God has given us? Why is it they got it off in all kinds of isms and creeds and dogmas and you can't tell what is what? It's exactly the way they've always done it. God promised it to be straightened out to the seed anyhow at the end time. Now notice, in this, we find that all of them rallied around that great gift and Israel blossomed like never before. All nations feared Israel. They were afraid to come over there because they know that God was with them. Now I tell you, you talk about shutting up communism and everything. Just let America come back to God, back to her gift, back to the Holy Ghost. And people have to quit hollering about communism. It's so worm-weeded in until even communists has anti-communist setups to find out who they are. The thing has to be that way. But let them come back. You're not long ago in Finland. Brother Lindsay, I believe he was here last night, was with me when it happened. Um, a little boy that I'd seen in the vision here was raised up from the dead over there. Many of you, I guess, still have it wrote in your Bible as across the nation, saying what he would look like, where he would be, and so forth. And he was raised up from the dead according to the word of the Lord. had been killed by an automobile accident. Many of you remember the case. And standing there when he was raised up from the dead, that night going down to the Massaholy, Brother Lindsay and I and Brother Moore and many of the men trying to get down to the Massaholy where they let so many thousand, let me speak to them, then turn them out and speak to more. On the road down, they had four or five city blocks. It was all blocked off. People was in the, in the um, streets to watch us coming in and going out. And in there, there had been a little girl on crutches, one leg short of the other, been healed, and many things had been done. And then this little boy being raised up, it went on news. They don't have uh, rock and roll and stuff in Finland, or they didn't then. It's only news and things was worthwhile they had on radio. And that it went all the way down into Russia. If you live in Russia and 40 miles from your home, your birthplace, you've got to have a visa to show your business. And the, the Iron Curtain was right, we walked right down to it where the machine guns were sitting in the street just out of Colpio. That night, this news that went down and the streets were piled by thousands times thousands of Russians. Here was those communistic soldiers, Russian soldiers, those rat, little round caps on, and six little Finnish boys right at that war. They'd never been old enough to shave yet. They were slick-faced boys, big old boots on, big long coats, walking down the street with these sabers and things, watching so I could get through the crowd to get in. Here stood those Russians standing there. When I come by, they come to attention, whole like that, and the tears run down their cheeks. And when I pass by, they grab them Finnish soldiers and pat them on the back and hug them. 
Anything will make a Russian pad of thin will settle wars. They said this we will receive a God that can raise up the dead. That's what's the matter tonight, friend. Exactly. What's made them communistic because the clergy has let down on the word of God. They taken all the money and have nothing to give back and instead just to like a lodge or anything else. That's what's wrong with the world. And we find that in the days of Solomon, they were all rallying around this great gift that Solomon had from the Lord. And the people were coming and going. All the nations feared Israel. Instead of trying to make war with them, they brought in peace offerings. They were not afraid so much of their man. They were afraid of that God that they were all in unity with. Oh, what a thing that would be to this nation tonight if we'd all be in fear of God, if we'd all respect God and receive His gift of the Holy Ghost and rally around it. Every church break down their creeds and throw them out the door and get out the altar and stay till the Holy Ghost come to identify His Word in the last day. Some of them trying to say why well, it's just for the Jews to get it. That's all there was to it. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children, to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. As long as there's a seed waiting in the earth to be called, there's a Holy Ghost to call it to it. That's right, it's still just the same. But we find out when it comes, it's rejected. That's the reason the nation comes under condemnation. That's the reason things are going the way they are tonight. And we find in Solomon's time it wasn't so. All of them rallied around that gift of discernment that Solomon had. And the nations all feared God. And it, news spread out everywhere. Oh, you should come to Israel. Their God has raised up a gift among them and they made him king. And his wisdom, his discernment is beyond human recognition. It's beyond. It's in the realms of gods out in there, the heathens say. And we... Don't understand how it is, but God, their God has represented himself in one of their believers, and he, they set him up on a throne, and they all listened to him. You know, the news scattered then, not by television, telephone, and so forth. It was lit by ear. Finally, the news broke, plumbed down across the Sahara Desert, all the way into a little country called Sheba. They had, it's a heathen country. They had a little queen down there. It was no doubt a, a nice little lady. And the news came to her that God was giving a great revival up there in the land of Israel. And great things were taking place. And they had a man up there anointed with the spirit of their God that even his wisdom surpassed anything that man could think of. You know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. That stirred her little heart. She began to think about it. And now as... Ever a caravan came by, no doubt the little queen would send out her soldiers and say, I'd like to speak to the person in private if they have come from Israel. Yes, queen, we have been up in Israel and oh, it is marvelous. You should see it. There's nothing like it. It's beyond man's understanding. You know, all of them are in one accord. Every one of them's right around that gift that their God has given them. And they all believe it with one accord. Oh, it's the most grandest thing. And there's nothing with help. God just reveals everything. If any nation start over there on them, why, well, the God of theirs would reveal where this coming and ambush them before they got there. Oh, it was just a great revival going on. Then, you know, the little queen began to get hungry to see it herself. You know, there's something about it. Man knows that he come from somewhere. And he's here, he don't know why he's here, and he's going somewhere, he doesn't know where he's going. And there's only one book in the world that tells us who you are, where you come from, what you are, and where you're going, and that's the Bible. It's the only one that tells you. And it's God's book, it's God himself manifested in word form, called a seed. That seed in the right kind of ground will produce every promise that he made, because it's God himself. But it has to be... Uh, watered by faith to make it come to pass like any other seed. The germ is in it. No, notice now. We find that in this doing, the little queen began to hunger and thirst for God. Oh, if, if the gifts of God could only create a thirst in the people's heart for him, like it did to her. Now we find out, so that the children, little fellows, there's a whole row of them sitting here and 
different places that they might understand. We'll give it kind of a drama for them so they'll understand. Now, remember, she was a pagan. So in order to do this and being a queen, she would have to get permission from her pagan priest in order to go. And I can imagine seeing her go over to him and make her bows and say, Great, holy father, so-and-so. Uh, you know, the Israelites has got a revival up there, and their God is representing himself in the form of a man by a great gift that he knows the secrets of the heart. And they tell me that he is the Word, and the Word is the discerner of the thoughts of the heart, and they say it's operating in a man. I would like your permission, Most Holy Father, to go up there and to visit and see for myself. Well, I can imagine your answer coming back. We don't have any cooperation in that revival. <laughs> or that's the 64 version of it. But anyhow, they, they say they don't belong to our denomination. They're not of our people. We have nothing to do into it at all. You shall not go. And they're nothing but a bunch of, of cranks. They hear all kinds of rumors about them coming through a Red Sea and all that kind of stuff. But there's nothing about it. Here's our great God. See him standing on the side of the wall. They were so and so and so many times they've done so and so. The little queen went away disgusted. But you know, there's something about it. If God begins to put a hunger in a human heart, there's just nothing going to stand in its way. Whether there's cooperation or not, or whether there's anything, she's got to find that. Like I said about the little woman last night, being uh, persistent and persevering. See, something gets a hold of you and you get a hold of something. Like Jacob, the son of, of God, Jacob, God's son, got a hold of something one night and it got a hold of him. And he never let it go until he achieved his purpose, blessed of it. That, that's the real thing. And when man impersonates something, it never works out right. But if you can get a hold of that something and that something get a hold of you, it's going to happen. If you come here tonight for healing and let the Holy Spirit get a hold of you and you get a hold of it, you're going to get what you ask for. There's no way of keeping it from you. You come believing that Jesus Christ saves and there's a saving power gets a hold of you and you hold it, you're going to get saved. If you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you to baptize you and you get a hold of Him, you won't have to move from your seat. He'll fill you with His presence right there where you are just as He did while Peter yet spake these words the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard it. Something got a hold. Something got a hold of that little seraphy open woman we spoke of last night. No matter how many hindrances she had, she still was going anyhow. Something got a hold of this little queen we're talking about tonight. A pagan, a heathen. So was this little seraphy open a Greek. A pagan, idol worshiper. But something got a hold of them. And they got a hold of something. There's always difficulties in the way. Satan throws everything in the way he can when he sees a real move of God get started. He'll do it to you. He'll put everything, all the hindrances he can in your way. Remember, the woman had a lot of hindrances, but her faith didn't have any. Faith has no hindrance. There's nothing going to stop it. No matter what anybody says, if you've got that right hold on God, God's a right, right hold on you, there could be 40 doctors standing here telling you he's dying and you wouldn't believe one word of it. No, sir. No, sir. There could be 40 clergymen standing here like Ahab's 400 would stand. If you're a Micah and got a hold of God, God's got a hold of you and you see it vindicated in the Word, there's nothing going to stop you or going to stand there anyhow because something's got a hold of you. It's revealed to that little woman that there was a God somewhere. I can see her go read those Hebrew scrolls again, roll them up and put them down in the, the jar and walk back to that pagan priest and say, I want to tell you something, Holy Father. It might be so, the things you're saying, but look, my grandmother worshipped that idol. She read that catechism you got. My great-grandmother read it. My mother read it. All my people read it. It's all about something that did happen. I've never seen a move of it yet. But they tell me they got something up there that's real, moving right now. Not some history, but something that's now going on. Now, looky here, you say, my child, if you go, I'll excommunicate you. And you have no business as a queen associate yourself with such people as that. That same old devil still lives. 
There's no better crowd in the world to get into than a born-again church filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't care where it's at. If it's in the alley or wherever it is, it's the best crowd. That's a heavenly group. Notice believers who believe in God. Her heart was thumping heavy with anticipation. She wanted to see. She had heard about it. She knew nothing about it, but she wanted to see it. I can hear her say, well, you can just take my name off the book if you want to. Whatever you say in them idols and them books and things, I see you keep telling about something, telling about something. It's never moved. I've never seen a move of it yet. I want something that's real. And she gets ready to go. Too bad we got more of them little queens today. Right, so then we find out that now in order to go, she used a very good tactic. I'd like for everybody to think of this. Now she said she didn't know. She'd read all the scrolls to find out what Jehovah was to see where he had worked in days gone by. If that be so, then he'd identify himself with this man as they said he was, then that was Jehovah. And if it was Jehovah, and he was a true God, the God of the living, not some statue or monument of some creature that lived or didn't live, this was a living, present God right now. So she wanted to get ready to go. Now she said... She packed up a lot of money. She took gold and myrrh and all of frankincense, I suppose, and silver, and she laden camels with it. Now she said this, I'm going up and I'm going to look into it myself. And then if it's so, I'll support it. If it isn't so, I'll have nothing to do with it. You know, she could teach Pentecostal something. A lot of them support a program that laughs and makes fun of you. You support a program on the air that makes fun of the things you believe in. And that's right. Yes. Because it sounds right. Sure, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, Jesus said. But notice her. She said, if it isn't, then I can bring my gifts back. But she's going to see for herself and be convinced she'd read the scrolls. She knew what Jehovah was, and she'll see if he was, he is, then he's still Jehovah. That's good today. Jesus Christ is what he was, and he always will be. He never changes. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We find the little woman then talk about hindrances. Then this might have come through her mind. Remember, I've got to cross the desert. And that's a very long trip. Measured from Israel, from Palestine, down into Sheba, across the Sahara Desert. It would take a camel about, I think the caravans take them 90 days, three months, traveling constantly to go from one place to the other. Three day, uh, three uh, months to go. And you think she come across that hot desert. She had that in her mind. She had to do it. Across that hot desert, all the way up here to find out if this truly was God. No wonder Jesus said she'll stand with this generation and condemn it. She didn't have an air-conditioned Cadillac, and some people here in Dallas won't come across the street to hear it. Right. No wonder she'll stand in the last days, but stand over somewhere and criticize it. Anywhere else they do it. Said she'll come from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and a greater than Solomon this year. Notice she had that to confront her. She probably had to travel by night. So hot on the desert. The direct rays of the sun upon that Sahara desert would take the hide right off of you. And there she had to travel maybe by night. Another thing. Remember she was loaded down with offerings and things. The sons of Ishmael were fleet horsemen. They were robbers on the desert. How easy it would have been for Ishmael's children to come in like a flood and cut them two or three little eunuchs you had with her, a little group of soldiers, eunuchs, and their little maids, cut them down and let them lay there and packed off tens of thousands, times thousands of dollars worth of jewels. Besides the costly frankincense and myrrh and stuff that she was bringing for her gift. But there's something about it. If your heart is set to see God and something's got a hold of you, you don't know no danger. You don't know no defeat. Amen. There's something you're going to get it anyhow. No matter what the difficulty is. Sure, it looked like a very setup for the robbers. Any of them could have come, but she didn't take the thought of any danger. She didn't take the thought whether she could get up and walk like somebody afraid to rise from a bed or a cot or something. Or I don't know. See, I'm afraid to do it. She didn't have that kind of a fear. Something had a hold of her. And if something can get a hold of us in the same manner, something's going to take place. Amen. Now, you can't do it until that gets a hold of you. 
you better not try it. But when that's a hold of you, it's going to happen. Notice, here she is. She never thought of how many robbers there was on the desert. Uh, again, when she got up there, would she be received or not? She was of another denomination, you know. So, would she be received? Would she be welcome at the meeting? She wasn't asked to come. Holy Spirit worked on her to come. So, he was the one doing the leading. So, to satisfy that feeling that she had, that she longed to know. Remember, it's your life. It was her life. You've only got one time to settle it. And maybe tonight is your last opportunity. You turn Christ down tonight, you may not have another opportunity. And that might have been her last opportunity. She realized that. Was her cold farm religion she had all right? Or was there truly a living God? She'd seen nothing in her own religion, but she'd heard there was something in the other one. And she'd read of what he was. She wanted to see it was her life was at stake. It's my life tonight. I have to face this. I have to come to the judgment. So do you have to come to the judgment. It behooves us to sit in our seats, lay on our beds or wherever we are, and consider this thing deeply, because you don't know what time your car is going to be taken out of God's rack up there and your answer at the judgment. Whether you're a church member or whether you're not, that has nothing to do with it. You're going to answer anyhow. And you better be dead sure of it. Check your experience with God. See if something really has got a hold of you that brings you back to this word. Away from creeds and forms and so forth. He promised it in the last days. There would be a turning again in the hearts of the children to the fathers. We believe that. Notice. We find it in this day now. And she take no thought of fear or anything was to bother. She wasn't thinking about that. The idea was she wanted to find out if it was real or not. So across the desert she went. And not, she had a hard time doing it. Anything that you have, that's a trouble. We Pentecostals. We just got everything handed to us on a platter. Everything we want. The pastor don't come just on time. I'll leave the assemblies and join the church of God. And, uh, you know, it's just, we just so babe it around. Reminds me of an old salt one time coming from the sea. And a poet went out and never seen the sea. He had wrote about it, but never seen it. The old salt met him. He said, where goest thou, my good man? He said, I'm going to the sea. I'm a poet. I have wrote of the sea. I long to smell the brine and see its great briny waves leaping around the gulls are singing and blue sky reflected itself in the sea. The old salt puffed his pipe four or five times, looked down, spit, said, I was born on it 70 years ago. I don't see nothing so attractive about it. He had lived on it so long to become common. That's what it is with us tonight. We've lived in the presence of God so long to it's become common to us. We ought to wake ourselves up and realize that Jesus Christ is alive and is raised from the dead. This is all to be a new experience for this little queen. She was persistent. She wanted to see it. Certainly she was persistent. She had to persist to leave her nation. She had all of her prestige. She had to leave behind. What of all of her card society and all she belonged to? All the stitch and sew circles and things that she belonged to as a queen. All the celebrity that she knew. She'd be a laughing stock to that group. Well, what difference did it make to her? It was her soul. It's your soul. It's my soul. What difference does it make to the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, or oneness, twoness, threeness, or whatever it is? It's my soul that's concerned. It's your soul that's concerned. It's God's Word that's being dedicated. We find her. She didn't make any difference to her. What anybody said or what her celebrity, what her friends, if she had to leave everything there was in the world, if it was real, she is ready to go to it. She'd give her kingdom anything else. If it was real, she wanted to find God. There was something in her heart. We find out across the desert she came. Finally, day after day, 90 days, three months, the caravan finally arrived at the gate. Now, she never come like a lot of people do in meetings today. Many of them come and they'll say, <clears throat> I hear they got a, <clears throat> somebody told me they had, mm-hmm. well, I'll go over. And they'll sit down just for a moment. Watch them. You see them everywhere. They'll say, the first word he says is contrary to my belief, out the door they're gone. I'll never go back to hear another one again. See, they just don't sit long enough. That's it. What about when Jesus, when he's sitting before his 70 there, and he had 70, and he had the whole multitude. He was a great man. He was a prophet, they said, the Galilean prophet. One day he looked upon that great crowd standing around him. He said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Could you imagine the physician sitting out there, what they said about that man? 
Why, he'll make vampires out of us. Drink his blood and eat his flesh. He never explained it. He didn't have to explain it. He had to shake off the parasites that was around him. Instead of trying to baby and put their name on a book, he shake them away. He had no reuse for them. So he find out there he was. He said, except he never explained it. Watch, those disciples sat still. They never said nothing. I see the doctor and see the Pharisees. said, see, the man's out of his mind. He's crazy. Wants to cut up his body now and eat it and drink his blood. Human vampire. Well, we, we couldn't do a thing like that. Oh, that's crazy. The man's out of his mind. Walked away. Then he looked around to those theologians sitting around him, them 70. And he said, what will you say when you see the Son of Man ascending up into heaven from whence he came? Them doctors of divinity looking around said, the Son of Man ascended up into heaven from where he came while we know him. We've been to the stable where he was born. We've seen the cradle he was rocked in. We know his mother. We, he fishes with us. He hunts with us. He's out here on the hills. He wears the clothes that we do. Eat the food. And this son of man, where did he come from? He come from Nazareth. This is too much for us. Away they went. He still didn't explain it. See, he, looked, he looked around to the twelve and said, Will you go also? Now, they couldn't explain it either. But something had a hold of them. See? They know. That's when Peter said those memorial words. Lord, we have seen the scripture vindicated by you. Where would we go? We know that thou has a words of life. Thou art the fountain of life. We are satisfied of this. Jesus said, I chose 12 of you and one of you is the devil. <laughs> he had no bones and polishing and bathing and pat him on the back and baptize him secretly or something or another. He, he was God made flesh on earth. He was a vindicated word of God. And those who hungered come. Those who did not hunger could not come. He said, all the fathers giving me will come. How can you come and, unless he has given, been given? Now, notice we find this little queen. She finally arrived. She didn't wait just like those people did. Some of them fought along. There's always three classes of people. Believers make believers and unbelievers. The unbeliever get up and walk away. The make-believer will stand around for a long time. There are all three of them was the unbeliever, the crowd, the make-believer, the group that turned away last. But there was a genuine believer who could not explain it. They know nothing about it. But they know that he was the Word. That settled it. There we find the little queen. She brought a whole lot of food, many pieces of bread and a lot of stuff. She brought her tents and things. She told her... Uh, Things off of the camels and things out in the yard, the courts of the temple. And she pitched her tents and was there to stay till she was convinced when it was right or wrong. No doubt, day by day, she had read those scriptures. Nighttime, they probably had to travel by night and daytime. And she'd sit back under those palm trees in the oasis in the desert and read what Jehovah was, what he was supposed to be. Now, she would know Jehovah if he was in that man. She'd know his action. She'd know what it was right or not. So she was all posted in the Scripture. She didn't go there and say, Now, if he says anything different from what my priest says, I'll just pick up my camels and go away. She was going to stay till she was convinced. Amen. Oh, if men and women would only do that today, take the Scripture. See if the Holy Spirit's far today or not. See if these things we're talking about are predicted for this hour that we're in. But she did. That's the reason Jesus said her name is infallible. And not infallible, but it's immortal. She'll stand in the day of judgment and condemn Dallas, Texas. She'll condemn the United States in the day of the judgment. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. A resurrected Jesus Christ is here. In the power of his resurrection. Notice. And she pitched her tents. I can imagine that morning for the children's sake now, the bells rang, the trumpets sounded, and church was on. They had church every day. Think of it. They loved to go to church every day. So the uh, church started. I imagine the little queen went way back in the back and sat down. And after a while, all the trumpets sounded, the hymns were sung and everything. After a while, Pastor Solomon came out, sat down, how all the people regarded him because they loved him. He was God's servant. And they come out, there wasn't one stand. Hmm, he was just this. If he just belonged to my group. No, there's only one group, and that was, that was them. So there they was. And then we find out someone come up, and the first thing you know, Solomon revealed the secret of their heart. I imagine the little queen said, now wait just a minute. You see. My, that sounded real. Next one come up, found the same thing. Oh, her little heart began to jump. She, she wondered, 
So she must have got a prayer card. <laughs> waited. Excuse that expression, but, you know, just to make a point. See, she might have got a card and she waited. One day her card was called. And she come up before the Holy Spirit that was working through Solomon. And the Bible said there was nothing hid from Solomon. The great Holy Spirit revealed everything that she had need to hear. He revealed. And here was the Holy Spirit, its fullness in Jesus Christ, doing the same thing in those Pharisees saying, show us a sign. Heal this man out here. Do this and say this and what will be this or that. See, they just don't understand. This little queen standing there and the Bible said that nothing was held back from Solomon. He revealed all the things that she had need of knowing. He told her all about him. And when it did, she didn't have to take somebody else's word. She would watched it and she believed it. Then she turned to the audience and she said, All that I heard when I heard it, I wondered. But all that I heard is so and more than I heard it so. See, it was her turn. She had seen it. It was worked on her. She knew it was real. And she said, Blessed be the Lord God who has made you his servant. Blessed be the... What was it? The poor little woman had lived under all those creeds and idols. And one time in her hungry heart, any real believer wants to see God in action. If he ever was God, he's still God. And she seen something that was real, not put on, genuine real. She served God the rest of her days. For she's seen something that was real. Oh, friend, we've seen so many join this creed, this Muslim, this whatever it is, come to this and this, that, and other, all kinds of sensations and things. Surely the world ought to be hungry tonight for something real. See something that's genuine. Not some mythic bunch of flowing blood or scratches or oil or something that not even scriptural, but a real Jesus Christ who promised that he would live in his people in this last days and do the things that he did. Something that the scripture says would take place in these days. All these little creeds. Well, if you know our creed, you know, see, you're, you're, you're looking back to what uh, uh, Mr. Luther said, a great man of his day. Sure. No more than some of these women here, 75 years old, trying to be 16. Looking back and trying to dress like they're 16, cut off their hair and wear shorts and make... Anybody who drives looking through a rearview mirror has a wreck. That's what's the matter at the church today. It's looking through a rearview mirror to what was. No wonder it's wrecked up. Don't never, Paul said, pressing to the mark of the high calling. I go forth. I go forward. I know Mr. Moody was a great man. Mr. Wesley was a great man. The Pentecostal move, the Baptist move were great, but let's press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ. Don't look through a rear view mirror 40 years ago. Look what is tonight. Look what the scripture promises tonight. He did promise them in that day, but we're living on above there now. We're going on. Uh, what if Wesley would have looked back and seen what Luther see? but he didn't look what Luther said. He looked what God said. What if the Pentecostal looked back towards the Methodists? See where you'd been? There you are, the same thing. You organize and cramped it down. You can't move anywhere. Now the Spirit of God just moves right on out, takes it on somewhere else. Every time they do it, a man-made system where you get all worked up like that, it's again like the gainsaying of Korah, how Dathan and them want to get a big bunch of men and make an organization out there. God said, separate yourself, Moses, from them. I'll swallow them right up in the earth. And that was a type of the journey today, and you know it, on the road to the promised land. There they was. They couldn't believe that anointed message of God that was moving right on. And they wanted to start something themselves. It's always that way. Israel's most rational move they ever made when they rejected grace in Exodus 19 and took the law. And Nathan made the awful mistake he ever made when he said, There's more leaders in here besides you, Moses. And, and it had been vindicated that he was God's manifested word. He had tucked dust and turned it into fleas. And everything that he had said had come to pass. And God was with him, a pillar of fire, vindicated, hanging above him there. And still they want to start something else. That's just man-made. That's the way it is today. That's where the church has got. That's right. Oh, church of the living God. Don't you want to see something real? Something real. A little story before praying for the sick. I like to hunt. My mother, you know, is <laughs> she, her mother drawed the pension. She's a Cherokee Indian. Uh, and my conversion, never taking the love of the woods. I love it. That's where you see God. 
That's where I first saw God, is out there in the woods. There's where he meets us. There's where he does the talking. That's where those seven angels met that you, on oh, sirs, what time is it? Brother Borders and I sitting there the other day, when that stand come down a whirlwind out of the heavens, he even tore the rocks out right above where I was standing there. What he said. See? And there, all many men, Brother Softman here somewhere, one of, Terry, I believe, over here was present at that time. And the things you see in the wilderness out there, I love to hunt. I do that just to get out, not to kill the game, but just to be in the woods. I used to hunt with a fellow up in New York, up in uh, New Hampshire, rather. He was a, a fine hunter. His name was Bert. He was an Englishman. He, his uh, parents established or cut that, where they call Jefferson Notch through there, and over to Call Notch. He separated that in the early days. There's a little Indian about him, too, but he was one of the best shots I ever seen, and one of the finest hunters. Never had to worry about going out and hunting him up. He knew where he was at. I used to love to hunt the white-tailed deer up there, and, they, and um, I'd go up every fall and hunt. And he was such a fine hunter, but he was the cruelest man I ever met in my life. He had eyes like a lizard, and he just, them kind of, you know, like the women try to paint their eyes today, kind of lizard-like. Well, he actually had that kind of eye, and it don't look like human to me. And so uh, uh, I always kind of hated to look at him. He was so slimy looking like that, you know, looking at my eyes sideways. And he loved to be mean, and he'd shoot fawns, that's little baby deer, just to make me feel bad. And he'd say, oh, preacher, you're like the rest of them. You're chicken hard. You'd be a good hunter if you wasn't a preacher. I said, I'm hunting souls, Bert. And I said, you got one that's lost. <laughs> and he's all getting next to yourself. I said, Billy, you're all right, but said, don't talk that kind of stuff to me. So he'd, um, he'd shoot those little fawns, and... And it I just make me feel so bad. Now, it's all right to kill a fawn if the law says so. Now, the size or sect is whatever the law says. I game warden for many years. But look, Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God. So there ain't nothing about killing the fawn if the law says. But not just shoot him, just let him lay there and act smart about it. That's wrong. That's wrong in doing it. So I just said that to justify my hunting brothers here, you see, so it should see what I'm trying to mean. Now, notice this, that we find that this man... One day I went up there, wife and I were together, and, and he had made him a little whistle that blowed and sounded just like a little baby fawn crying, a little funny blate they make. Well, as long as I had been working, I hadn't got it through in time in a meeting, and I went up to hunt with him, and there had been a lot of hunting going on. And you know, First time a gun fires in that country, them white tail, you, have, you thought Houdini was a escape artist. He was an amateur to them. And the first thing you know, they'd all hide. If in moonlight they'd graze at night or get her a brush pile or something, and they, they wouldn't move. Then we see, that day I said, Bert, you're, you're not going to use that whistle. He said, oh, preacher, you're so chicken hard. He said, get next to yourself. And we started out, and we put a, some sandwiches in our, in our shirt. And we hunt, was going to hunt to about noon up around the rims of the top of the, of the presidential range, and then separate and come back down. If we got a deer, we know where it would be hanging we go pull it out in a day or two and hang it up. So there's about, oh, four inches of snow or six, something like that. It's good tracking time. And we started off, got along about up the mountain, not a track. There wasn't a thing. The moon shining at night, the deer. Bert was in front of me, leading the way. And so um, I was walking along behind him, and he just kind of uh, sat down like that. The snow was dry, and he started reaching back. I thought he was going to eat the sandwich, and we just apart from there because it was way high in the mountain then. And he reached back here and I started getting my sandwich and I started to find a place to set my rifle down and, and I started to get my sandwich and I looked around. He brought this little whistle out. I, I thought, boy, that's a dirty trick to do that. So he um, took this little whistle and looked at me in them lizard eyes and looked up at me and he put that little whistle in his mouth like that. And I said, Bert, you wouldn't do a thing like that, would you? <laughs> and he blowed like that. And to my surprise, about... Fifty yards from me, just across, a great big doe stood up. Now, the doe was the mother deer. And there she was, her big brown eyes and them ears peeked up. See? She heard. Now, she was a mother, see? And her baby was crying. And so, no matter where the rest of them come out or not, there was something in her. She was a mother. So, Bert looked like that, and he blowed it again real low, and that deer walked right out into the opening. Now, that's unusual, very unusual. Walk out like that. And she's looking around with a big head up and her eyes looking around. After a while, when the hunter reached up and got the gun, she's seen the hunter. Usually they'll just flash and gone. You know how it is quickly. 
But you know, she never moved. She just stood and looked at him broadside and turned her head and looked. My, I thought, Bert, you can't do that. See, she wasn't putting on something. She wasn't hypocritically. She wasn't acting. She was born in her. She was a mother. And that baby, I don't care if it costed her life, it was in trouble. She was trying to find that baby. It was in trouble. She was the instinct in her. She was mother. And she saw the hunter. But her mind wasn't about the hunter. It was about that baby in trouble, that little fawn. And so he pulled the safety down on this thirty oh six. Oh, he was a dead shot. He leveled that rifle down. I, I just had to turn my head. I couldn't keep from it. I, I couldn't look at him. Thought just a couple more minutes and he'll blow her loyal heart out trying to find her baby. It's in trouble. Knowing that hunter laying right there in the bush. And he'd blow that loyal heart plumb through her, that 180 grain bullet in there. And I, I, he was such a dead shot. He leveled. I thought, I just can't stand to look at it. I turned my back, and, uh, and I, I said, Lord, help him, uh, that he won't do that. I, I felt so sorry that poor mother standing there hunting for a baby. And I know she wasn't putting that on. She was a mother. She'd have run any other time. She wouldn't have got up and was going by. But there was something in her. And I waited, and I waited, and the gun never went off. Well, I wonder what's the matter. I waited. Then I turned around real slow, and I seen the deer standing out there still looking at him. And I looked at the gun barrel, and he's going like this. <laughs> he just, he's trying to hold aim, and he couldn't do it. He threw the gun down on the ground and looked around at me, and that big eyes had changed. The tears was running down his cheeks. He grabbed me by the trouser leg. He said, Billy, lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. <laughs> what was it? He saw something real. See, that little mother deer had to display a loyalty, a real loyalty that made that cruel hunter there that had the wickedest heart I ever seen. It wasn't a sermon I preached. It was what he seen, something that was real. It wasn't put on. It wasn't a sham. That was a genuine mother seeking for her baby. And that led him to Christ. He's a deacon in a church there now. A wonderful Christian because he saw something that wasn't put on. It wasn't a make-believe. It was real. Oh, brother, sister, if this church, if this people tonight, if you and I, there's something real, not a put on. You might see some putting it on, but there's a genuine thing. There's something in a man that makes him live for God. There's a genuine Holy Spirit tonight, brother. That's not a put on. It's a genuine thing. And how many in here would like to be as much Christian and as loyal to Christ, death, persecution, anything else, you'd love to be as much Christian as that dear was a mother. Would you like, wouldn't you like to be that? I would long to be that kind of a Christian. That even like that little Seraphie open woman last night was that kind of a Christian. This little queen we're talking about tonight was that kind of a Christian. When she saw something that was real, she was ready. God help us tonight to receive something real. Christ, let us bow our heads just a moment while we pray. Now I wonder in the building tonight if, is, if there's any here, while you're real quiet, there's any here that would like and don't know Christ as your personal Savior and you would like to know him as your Savior, would you raise up your hand? One, two, three. God bless you. 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 I wonder if there's some here tonight that's claimed to be a Christian, maybe a member of a fine church, of a great bunch of people, but yet you know down in your heart that you haven't got Christianity in your heart, born into it, just like that mother was, a deer was born to be a mother. She was mother through and through. And you'd like to become a real Christian like that little mother dear was a mother. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. God bless you. God bless you. All around, up in the balconies, I see your hand. Heavenly Father, little did I know on that cold November day, standing there, snow all down my neck, wet, to see that man laying there, how I talked to him, held his hand, cried with him. 
told him about the Bible and everything. And he said, oh, you're perhaps right. But to see you have to send around something so real that right in the way of nature that he just couldn't keep from seeing that there was something real. And now he's your servant, Lord. Now there's many here tonight, some of them raise their hands, Father, that they never have been a Christian and they want to become one. God, just don't let them be one of these, just run and join church or take some farm or creed or baptism. But let it be born in their heart, Christ. And those who have joined church, they, they're seeking, Lord, like perhaps the, the little woman, the little queen we've been talking about. Uh, she, she's hungering for something, and, and they are too, Lord. And when she's seen something that was real, that identified God in human beings, she was ready then, and she said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. She wanted no more to do with pagan farms. And Father, many here tonight, no doubt, in that same state. That if they can just see something real, and you told us when you were here in the world that what would take place in this day, we're told that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know how you was identified, how the Pharisees failed to see it. Lord, the same groups today are failing to see it by belonging to church, joining, having certain forms of creeds and so forth. They, they fail to see the Messiah, the great Holy Spirit, identifying himself with the people. As you promised you would, grant tonight, Lord, that each one of these will realize and will see your presence. And may it come into their heart the text of greater than Solomon is here tonight. That's Jesus Christ, the resurrected Son of God, ready to come and to convert and to make hearts new and to put in them a born experience of God just like that mother doe. Something that she had nothing to do with, by the grace of God, she was chosen to be a dear. She was chosen to be a mother, and a loyal mother. And you told us we were chosen before the foundation of the world. I pray, God, that you'll let every one of those who has that drawing in their heart, like the little lady did, to find God, that tonight there'll be something real happen that they'll see and serve him. Far greater than Solomon is here. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now reverently, silently, just before we come to the altar, please, no one move around. Just be real reverent a moment. This is a solemn hour. Solemn moment. Decisions are being made. Many raise their hands. I believe you were deeply sincere in that when you said that. Now, you've heard about the Bible, you've heard about Jesus, you've heard he was the Son of God, you've been taught that he raised again, and you're taught that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, is this Holy Spirit that we talk about, is that Jesus Christ? Sure it is. See? He's God, known as God the Holy Ghost. It ain't another God, it's the same God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not three gods. It's three attributes of the same God, you see. Just the same God in three forms, you see. In other words, three offices, like, you know, when he, he served his Father and then his Son. It's God condescending, coming from one who cannot be touched, even to touch the mountain he had to die, till we could handle him in flesh. And now he's in you. He sanctified you with his blood that he might live in you. But that day you know I'm in the Father, Father, me, I in you, and you in me. See, it's God above us, God with us, God in us. See? And that's Christ tonight, the Holy Spirit. He's the same. And you are, he's the vine, and you're the branches. Have faith in him. And if he will identify himself tonight, being among us. Now, if he stood here with scars, that would be a human being. That's flesh. Anybody can impersonate that. A human being can disfigure himself, or maybe we don't know what Jesus looked like. We just got the... The, the artist's idea, the psychology of it, what he looked like. Hoffman had one kind, Selman another, and how many more? But how would you know him? It would be his life. Because if a man stood here with 
thorns prints in his hand and whatever more, that would be an imposter. Because when Jesus himself comes, every eye shall see him, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess it. But his spirit is here. See, And if we can just let our own minds drift into his, let the mind that was in Christ being you. He is the Word, and the Bible said the Word of God, which how many knows that Jesus was the Word? And the Bible, Hebrews 4. And the Bible said it's sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. Now, that's what was in Solomon, the Word, God, which he could discern the thought. That was in Jesus. See, that's what's here now. Same thing. Now, you out there, I ain't going to call on the prayer line because I'm going to make an altar call. And there might be some here that's never been in one of the meetings. I don't see a person in the building that I, that I know Someone was telling me that it was about 30 last night or better call. Do you realize that one time a woman touched his garment and he turned around and the same thing taking place and, and virtue went out of him, him the son of God? But he said, greater than this shall you do, for I go to the Father. Now you just believe and have faith. Each one of you all around here, these cot stretchers, wherever you are, believe. Don't think you're hopeless. Now if I could heal you, I'd do it. But I cannot heal you. I could lay hands upon you, and I intend to do that to everyone who's having them cards. And they give out cards every day. So I intend to do that. But that is, that, that's just to signify that I believe with you. But look, why don't you just touch him? The Bible said he's a high priest right now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Yes. Well, if he is a high priest, then he would certainly act in the same way he did then, right. would he not? He certainly would act the same way he did then. All right? Now, you touch him by faith. Now, Heavenly Father, the meeting is yours. But I have talked tonight on this little woman seeing something real when she's seen that spirit of discernment upon Solomon. And we are sure, Lord, that your words are true. You said that would return again like it was in the days of Sodom just before the coming. And you was the same yesterday, today, and forever. The works that you did, we'd do also. And you're a high priest tonight that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How much more do we need? How much do those Jews need to see that he was a prophet, a virgin conceived, and all these things? But they, their creeds blinded them. Lord, there's some here come like, maybe not from Sheba, but they've come from many places. I pray, God, that you'll identify yourself tonight real, and then identify yourself in them as the instinct of that mother and that little deer did that day. We are yours, Father. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to have faith and believe, each one of you, all around, everywhere. And just pray. I don't just look and pray now and just believe. See, this might not, the Holy Spirit not, might be pleased with doing this. If he doesn't, I'll call up a prayer line. But just stand here. Somebody out there, even if you, I don't want you with prayer cards. Just, just anybody, just, just pray. Of course, I wouldn't know, but you just pray and see. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know that man don't know me. He knows nothing about me. But I know that I do believe your faith is unconscious. Don't press now. Or jump. You jump away from it. It's right with you. Just relax yourself and leave Just believe now, have faith. I, the Lord Jesus Christ, speak unto my people. I say unto thee, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And ye come forward and confess thy sins. And ye, I, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall forgive thee of all of thine iniquities. And ye, I show thee a more perfect way. For yea, ye shall be held accountable for every unspoken word and every idle word on the great and noble day of the judgment. Yea, I say unto thee, my children, make the crooked path straight. And yea, I, the Lord thy God, shall confirm my word with signs following. I, the Lord Jesus Christ, have spoken. Amen. Be a reverend. Just have faith. Just believe.
Sometimes your faith is unconscious. You have it and you don't know it. That little woman had it. She didn't know it. How many of you have ever seen the picture of that angel of the Lord, that light? It's, it's taken right here in Texas. It's been taken all over the world now. But what do you think, sir? You believe? Sitting right here at the corner. <clears throat> Looks like you were looking so eagerly. You have many things wrong with you. You have complications. Many things. Now, when I said that, a real strange feeling come to you, didn't it? That's right. Raise up your hand. I'm a total stranger to you. I don't know you. That's right. You know what? That light is settled right down over you. See? That's what you felt. Kind of a real sweet feeling. I was watching it. See? Come right now. Now, yes, you're here. You want to be prayed for before you leave the building. If God will reveal to me what your trouble is and you sitting there and me here, would you believe it to be God? It's a hernia, one of your great things. That's right. Is that right? If God will tell me who you are, what your name is, you got a good contact with him now. Would you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? Excuse me, that's still not locked a lot. Of you believe it? Your name's Mr. Sturgeon. That's right. Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Believe Hallelujah. Him. Be healed. Praise the Lord. Here's a little lady sitting right back there, dark headed, right out here in the aisle. Yes, you. You was amazed when that was said. Now, right at this time, you begin to feel kind of strange, see? Real sweet, like something around you. If anyone will look, you, if you could see it, kind of an amber-looking light coming down upon the little lady. Now, what her trouble is, she has headaches that bothers her real bad. That is right. If that's right, raise up your hand. like that. And I've never seen her in my life. That's true. That's right. Headaches bothers her. Like a migraine. But they're going to leave you. Remember. Now the, there's a man sitting right next to you there. And he's looking right at me so earnestly. And that light is moving right over towards you. And the man is suffering trouble with his eyes. But if he'll believe, God will heal the eyes and make them well. You believe? All right. I've never seen you in my life. You're a stranger to me. Say that young fellow sitting right next to you there also, he suffers with trouble with his head. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. i never seen the man in my life. God knows him. All right? You believe. The man sitting right next to you, the glasses on, looking this away. Yes, you're wearing glasses, but that really isn't your trouble. You've got something wrong with your back that you're wanting to be prayed for. That's right. Wave your hand. All right? That young fellow sitting right next to you there, right next to you, he's had a lot of troubles. That young man has, yes, sir, with a red tie You've had a lot of troubles in your family and things. Kind of your wife's a nervous type of a person, and you're suffering with some kind of a pressure in your head also. That's thus saith the Lord. That is true. That's right. You just believe. Don't you doubt, but you believe. Here's a woman sitting right back here. Don't see that light move back here and settle down right here? She's suffering with an eye trouble in her bladder. Oh, she's going to miss it. Lord God, help me. Her name is Miss Chambers. Believe with all your heart, Mrs. Chambers. Raise up to your feet. Raise up so that the people see who you are. I'm a stranger. never seen her in my life. Yeah. It's over now. Jesus Christ makes you well. Hallelujah. Now, if that isn't Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, where is he? Did he promise to do it? All that believes it, raise up your hand. All right. Do you want to be a real Christian, you that raised your hand a while ago, like that old mother dear was? While the Holy Spirit here and the anointing is all over us, why don't you just make your way and come stand right here at the altar in just a minute? If you're seeking God for salvation, would you come here and just come here at this altar and stand here with me just a minute? Raise up, that's it. That's right. God bless you. Anybody in the building, anywhere you're at, will you come? That's right. Come right now. You that wants to find Christ, you'll never be no closer to him until you meet him. He's here. He's identified. Something real. You've joined church. A lot of you church members now. You've joined church. 
but that's all you have. You want to see something real. If that isn't exactly what Jesus Christ identified himself to be, look at this little child coming here crying, the tears running down his little face. No wonder they're tender. They haven't been pulled through everything. Another one coming down the aisle, another one in the back coming down. Little children. When the adults has passed theirs by, won't you come? Come right up here now and stand around the altar. You church members, you people that wants to have an experience of Christ in your heart, won't you come here? If he knows your heart, you know you couldn't hide it. Won't you come right now and stand here? Just before we go further, come here and stand here for a word of prayer. Will you do it? Come, show, stand for him. You stand for him. If you're ashamed of him now, he'll be ashamed of you there. Remember, he is here. The scripture said this would happen. Here he is identifying himself as being here. If you're a church member and don't know Christ as a real experience, won't you come at this time? Now, I'm not much to persuade people. The only thing I can say is tell you the truth. And if Christ's presence plus his word being made manifest up in the balcony, you didn't raise your hands. Sister, brother, if you want to come down, we're going to wait right here. Come right on down and gather around the altar. Just for a word of prayer. Let the world know. Let Jesus know that you're, that you're not ashamed. You want to be a real Christian. Won't you come? While we're just waiting a moment or two. Church member, lukewarm, backslider, won't you come stand along with them now? Come here and stand along. You who haven't, if you haven't got an experience with God, that you're born into the kingdom of God like that, what more do you want to see? Remember. I tell you, in the name of the Lord, if you regard me to be his servant, this is the last sign that the church will see according to the Scripture. That's the last thing that Abraham seen done before the promised son arrived. And we are the royal seed of Abraham. And Jesus promised the royal seed to see the same thing that Abraham seen just before the Gentile world burned. Don't put off for something else. Satan trying to get you to look over Come now, while there is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stain. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Won't you come and accept it now? Hallelujah. I'm waiting just a moment. Somebody else might come and stand here for prayer. Now, I'm going to ask ministers here, brethren, come down and stand with me around while we pray. And ministers out there, who's concerned? And some of these people in your neighborhood that would come to your church or, or something that you're interested in, in souls coming to Christ. And you believe this to be Jesus Christ. Now, remember, I am not Jesus Christ. I'm your brother, a sinner saved by grace. I'm like you are. But it's Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, that's here with us, keeping His Word. He don't have to do this, he, but He promised He would do it. Jesus didn't have to heal the sick, but the Bible said He did it that it might be fulfilled, which was promised of Him. Now, we don't care what brand of church that you belong to. If you believe that Jesus Christ is present, you believe that there is a born-again experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ministers, move right up in among these people here. Come right up among them, laying your hands on them. We're going to offer prayer for them. I'm asking the congregation to be just as reverent as you can for a few moments. How do we know what the Holy Spirit will do? That's it. Move right in. Mangle yourself right with the people. Come right around them, each one. Now remember, there's only one thing you can do is accept what He has promised you. Have you seen the reality of the resurrection of Christ? Now I'm going to ask the congregation if they'll stand just a minute in reverence and respect to them. Each one of you believe now. Confess all that you've done. That's all you can do. And then ask God to forgive you and accept it. Believe it. Now let everyone pray in your own way. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you with penitent souls. How the little story about that mother deer struck down deep that people wanted to do something or see something real, like the Queen of the South, who came from the uttermost parts of the earth, the air of the wisdom of Solomon. And a greater than Solomon is here, the Savior of mankind, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Save them, Father. Forgive their sins. Wash their souls in the blood of the Lamb and give them an experience of being born a Christian. 
No other animal, no nothing else could have done that but the mother deer. That's what she was. Give us that experience, Lord, now of a born-again experience in the kingdom of God while the Holy Spirit is there. Grant it, Lord. Grant it, Lord. Now, close your eyes. Raise up your hands and say, make your confession. Say, Jesus, I now believe. Take me as I am. There's no more I can do. Heal my sick body. Take me, Lord. I believe you're here. The Holy Spirit is here identifying itself. Save me by thy grace, Lord. That's all I know how to do. Through Jesus Christ. Brother,